Today's episode of the Center Phillips podcast is brought to you by Coalesce Apparel and Design, the brand new apparel store that I've opened that will be specializing in magic apparel and various designs. Uh, if you follow me on social media, you already know about the Attack University and Attack U concept that has come out. Put up a little poll earlier this week about the Simic concept that we are working on, and the Demir concept is already underway. So three of the 10 guilds down, and it looks like seven more to go. But we're gonna have a lot of uh, collaborations and projects that are coming out with Coalesque Apparel and Design. You can find those Attack University shirts on my Twitter at Cedric A. Phillips, but also at the Coalesque website at coalesqueapparel.shop. Um, also brought to you by the wonderful people over at StarCityGames.com, the world's largest Magic of the Gathering site. Uh, the SCD Tour is on hiatus this weekend, but it will fire up again next weekend for SCG Indianapolis. I will be there with Patrick Sullivan, uh, Brian Gottlieb, Jerry Thompson, Nick Miller, and the rest of the SCG Tour crew as we're going to prepare for Ravnica Allegiance release weekend. That is going to be a lot of fun. You can, of course, catch us over at StarCityGames.com and also Twitch.tv slash SCG Tour. And last but certainly not least, are my good pals over at Ultimate Guard, your home for premium protection products. If you are looking to pick up the brand new Katana Sleeves or Ammonite Anti-Theft Backpack, those will release globally on February 1st. The Katana Sleeves, of course, made in Japan available in 10 different colors impeccable quality and clarity fully opaque for those of you having to play double-faced cards like search for Ascanta or delver of secrets and for those of you looking for the premium backpack the ammonite anti-theft backpack is the one for you make sure you follow at ultimate guard on all social media and ultimateguard.com for more information with the sponsors out of the way yes sponsors of the podcast i now have to talk to you about the two people i'll be interviewing you very quickly in dom harvey and Tarek patel these guys are number one and two on the scd tour leaderboard and as you will find out over the next handful of minutes that is absolutely no accident. Jewel Vera going to play us in. And then we're talking with Dom. We're talking with Tarek. We're talking the leaders of the 2019 SCG Tour leaderboard. I love Alright everybody, welcome to another magical episode of the Cedric Phillips Podcast. I'm your host, Cedric Phillips, and you can of course find me at Cedric A. Phillips on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I am joined by uh, two people whose social media handles are going to get a little bit more popular now, that's for sure, because they are crushing the SCD tour in the early stages of 2019. Now Tarek, don't take this personally, I gotta start with the champion. That's fine. In Good. And Dom Harvey, uh, Dom, you are a SCG Tour champion with a fun build of Amulet Titan. How are you this evening? I'm good. Am I a player to watch now? Is that how this thing works? <laughs> yes, you you are definitely a player to watch now. You're going to be on all types of leaderboards now, so congratulations. Beautiful. And I, I believe Tarek is not a big social media guy, so if you want to take his clout and send it my way, that that's fine. Uh, hit me up on Facebook, at uh, Dom and Harvey on Twitter is what we're going with for right now, but... Yeah, it's good to be here. I was uh, a big fan of Set Talks back in the day, and there's there's a new sign on the door now, but kind of the same premise as I understand. So uh, good to be on this side of the microphone. Awesome. Definitely on the same premise. And trust me, my man, you've earned your way here, and we will definitely get into that over the course of this podcast. Now, Tarek, it is now your turn. I know, second place two weekends in a row. You, you suck, dude. <laughs> you know, if you're not first, you're last, right? That, that's the <laughs> famous adage. Uh, but honestly, you can't you can't complain about two seconds back to back. So I'm I'm pretty happy with my performance overall. Uh, nothing to be sad about, that's for sure. As I know, this podcast will likely be go go live on Wednesday. We're recording this on a Monday evening here, seven twelve in Seattle, Washington. They're on the East Coast, so ten twelve over there. Uh, Dom had mentioned before we started recording that he is refreshing the homepage of Star City Games quite a bit. Wants to see his name on top of that leaderboard, eh? I, you don't have to expose me that like that, but yes, I am. I'll be <laughs> just being brutally honest. <laughs> Hey, I know Abe Corrigan, Ethan, Ethan Gajewski, and Luke Feeney. They're on top right now as I look at it. I got the website open, of course. Uh, but eventually, we're going to have Dom and Tariq right there. And uh, to your guys' credit, you guys are fourth and fifth place right now. So first and second won't be so bad, right, Tariq? No, not at all. And while we're at it, I do want to give a shout out to our other teammate, Omar Belden. He did a lot of work in Columbus, and he's not here with us today. So 
just before we shout out a big shout out to him and a big thank you to him. Uh, and I've actually, I've actually played against Omar before. Good guy. Obviously a very good magic player. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah. O Omar's, uh, Omar's more the quiet type and he doesn't go on these just maniacal expeditions to, to opens and Massachusetts or whatever. But if, if he was joining us, uh, traveling around, he would be up there with us for sure. He's, uh, he's the, the quiet assassin that, uh, doesn't get the credit he deserves. Well, I don't know. Maybe that will change. We'll have to find out. But what, uh, where we're going to start honestly is we want you guys to become more familiar with the magic audience right now. Uh, as I mentioned, when this thing goes live, you'd be one and two on the leaderboard. Tarek, I'm going to start with you. Who are you? What do you do? What kind of a magic accomplishments do you have? What do the people need to know about you? Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, so my name is Tarek. Hello, to begin with. <laughs> um, I'm originally from Toronto, uh, Canada, Ontario. Uh, I lived there my entire life, born and raised. Um, was strong in the magic community for a couple of years. Um, previously, like, Previous accomplishments have to be, um, I've topped actually five SEGs now, uh, including one Invitational, but never really made a deep run at the Pro Tour or anything like that. Um, took a couple of years off, uh, went to medical school. I'm currently living in New Jersey in a town called Morristown, um, outside of the Bearded Dragon. Um, they're now my local family, and I play Magic uh, outside of New Jersey now. Uh, I've been living here for the last uh, four years now, so I'm like half Canadian, half American. <laughs> that's not that's not a bad place to be, but if you had to side with one, probably probably go to Canada. Canada's pretty great, and America's <laughs> America's an interesting state right now. Let's call it that. Yeah, for sure. Without making this too political of a podcast, uh, Dom, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are outside of the guy finding te finding teetering peaks off of Primeval Titan. Yeah. So in case you couldn't tell, I'm not really from around these parts. I uh, got the accent thing going on, uh, but I I moved from England to Toronto at the end of September and have just been diving into magic and everything else really since then. Uh, and basically all aspects of my life have just improved massively since I moved. Canada is great, uh, as you put it. Um, and magic's no exception. I, I, within a few weeks of arriving here, uh, top eight of 5k, then top eight of 3k, then, uh, made top 16 of the Envy. And then we had the back to back this past, uh, two weekends. So, uh, kind of on a high right now in magic and in everything else. Well, you are definitely on a streak. You too, Tarek. This has been an impressive run and I want to get into that. I want to start talking about SCG, Columbus, the team tournament. You guys obviously teamed up with Omar, as you mentioned, get second place, lose in the finals. Obviously, your goal is to win the tournaments, and Dom, um, we'll get to your win here as we make our way through the podcast. But let's talk about the team tournament. And Tarek, I'll start with you. Talk about how the team came together, how the decks came together, what the plan was, all of that good stuff that led you guys to second place. Yeah, for sure. So it's actually a, a fascinating story. So as Dominic mentioned, uh, just a couple of months ago, he was living in England. Um, as you know, I currently don't live in Toronto anymore. So when Dom moved to Toronto, he was active in our, our local scene up there in Toronto. Um, in Toronto, Face to Face has their own kind of closed circuit, closed series going on that hold local 5Ks, local 3Ks every couple of months. Um, as I was browsing through the deck list, I actually came across uh, quite an interesting take on KCI, uh, a deck which I was playing at the time currently. Um, having some ties back home in the Magic community, uh, including Edgar, who's been my friend for years, uh, Dilks, etc. Um, I asked about Dominic, you know, because when you see a deck list like that, you don't really know anything behind uh, behind the deck list. You don't know the type of player who's piloting the deck. And I really wanted to vet the person before I kind of jumped in and picked up a deck that I had no idea about. So reaching out to my friends back home in Toronto, I, I heard of this British kid that came over and was topping everything in sight and he was playing extremely solidly. And the words of my friend back home uh, were good enough to get me interested. So I ended up uh, adding Dominic on uh, Facebook. I reached out to him and we kind of chatted about KCI for a couple of weeks. Um, we, I, I liked the way he thought. He seemed like a very intellectual type of person. Um, and every year when I go home for Christmas to see my family, I usually hold uh, a Christmas get together where you know, all the local Magic players in, in the greater Toronto area kind of get together at my house. We queue, we hang out, we do fun stuff like that. And I invited Dominic along to to kind of meet him and get to know him. At the time, we were also making plans to go to SCG Columbus. And we needed a third, and Omar was there as well. So that's how the team of me, Omar, and Dominic kind of came together. And anybody who's played in Toronto knows that everybody in that group is is such a a tight player, like everybody even if you've never really heard of them they they're they're very solid magic players through and through i almost akin it to i don't want to say like the canadians are like the japanese but a lot of the culture is very similar in, in that 
I, I really believe that skill breeds skill. And when you have a lot of people so close together, a lot of people learn off each other very quickly. So anybody I would have probably picked up would have been just as good, but you know, everybody in our group is, is solid. So that's how our team came together. Uh, fast forward a week, we're in SCG Columbus and, and the rest is history. Dom, you, uh, you're you starting to make a name for yourself with innovative te- innovative takes on established strategies. Obviously, Ironworks, your take here with Sword of the Meek and Thopter Foundry, not traditional, not what we've been seeing Matt Nass, Sam Black, and many others putting up the victories with. Uh, explain to me how you came to this build of the deck and why it might be the right thing to be doing. So uh, I've been uh, playing Magic for a long time. I started back in uh, Betrayers of Kamigawa uh, back in 2005. So I, I just have a lot of history seeing how formats evolve and, and seeing how decks pop up and then change over time and, and the lessons that you can learn from that. And I was playing Thought of Depths and extended back eight or nine years ago now when that was a big thing. Uh, and so there were a few lessons there. Firstly, that Thought of Sword is great at just steamrolling any kind of fair strategy. It, it, it just makes it look like a joke. But then also that if you can take a deck that has this cohesive game plan and graft another plan onto it that has different strengths and weaknesses uh, without sacrificing too much in the process, then that's a great recipe for success. Uh, And so you look at that KCI list, you think he took KCI and added Thopter Foundry to it. It kind of went the other direction. I was looking for a good shelf for Thopter Foundry and realized that KCI already was the best deck in the format, potentially broken, which I'm sure we'll get onto in a second, uh, and shores up a lot of those weaknesses. So with Thopter Foundry, Anything that cares about playing to the board, you dominate, but then anything that goes over the top is is an issue. So Storm or KCI or Tron or whatever, and you want something that can race them. And KCI already is the best deck in the format at doing that, and also wants to play a bunch of Ica Wellsprings and Terrarians and Chromatic Stars, which are just free food for your Thopter Foundry if you don't have Sword yet. Uh, so that seemed like a match made in heaven, and as soon as I tried it, I was in. And uh, it's, I'm not going to say it's strictly better than than regular KCI, but it's uh, performing very well for me and, and continues uh, to this day. This is interesting. So you playing uh, Thopter, Sword, Thopter Sword, Thopter Depths, back in the day it was called DDT. Uh, Jerry T did a lot of work on that deck, obviously. Um, and that was a deck that won a lot of PTQs back then. That was actually a deck that I used to target with Dredge back then. Um, this is all dredging up old memories. Now I got ninth place at Grand Prix Oakland, uh, where that deck was very big when I played Dredge that weekend. And obviously being good friends with Jerry, I knew how much he was working in that deck. And Jerry is kind of a master of tuning, but also taking two concepts and putting them together. And I have this giant smell on my face right now because this actually makes a lot of sense and I'm surprised no one else has thought of this. Uh, your explanation makes so much sense on why this is a thing that people can do and having it be a backup plan or plan A. And what also kind of makes this interesting to me is, you know, the, the people who are listening to this podcast, I mean, DDT and that and that deck, that was like eight years ago. So to jam those two decks together and remember that deck and how powerful it was, because that deck was definitely the best deck and extended at the time. And now you're doing a similar thing here. I got to say, it's actually pretty brilliant, man. I, I try to keep my brain nimble. And one of the things I like <laughs> to do is just go back and read old magic content from years ago and just see what mindsets people were stuck in or and it might have made sense in the time but just the way people thought back in you know 2010 or the early 2000s or whatever and i I remember that format and the levels that jerry in particular was going with that (coughs) deck where initially you would you would go hard on the thought disorder plan and then people had ley lines and then how do we beat ley line well that sphinx of draw isle was there at one point and then you you would beat sphinx with maloku and then you would beat maloku with una and then like jerry was gifting for exile into darkness at one point it, it, people were just going off the rails and it was completely obscene and then and then and then jace was printed and that was better than everything else but for a while <laughs> you could you, you could have a lot of fun just going into gatherer finding obscure cards that somehow trump the mirror in some aspect and and going deep with that because the deck crushed everything else uh, except dredge some would argue and and then as soon as you uh, were focusing on the mirror, things just went out of control. It was insane. This is great because I feel like I'm actually just talking to Jerry right now. You have to understand that like I was privy to the conversations of him being like, what do you think about Exile? What do you think about this thing? What do you think about this thing? And I'm like, dude, you are going down. You're, you're in the think tank deeper than anyone's ever been in the think tank, man. Like he was trying everything to crack the mirror. And, and like you mentioned, the mirror was just kind of a total... Back a better term, kind of a shit show where you had to try some different things. Sphinx of Jar Isle was a thing. Maloku to beat that was a thing. So, oh man, I you are a student of the game, my friend. I am loving this. Uh, Tarek, let me ask you about. Uh, let me ask you about. Obviously, this Ironworks build, but Ironworks in general, because this is kind of the trendy question. We are getting to the next BNR announcements. You've played Ironworks for a little while. Is it time for anything to go? Yes, I am a strong believer that KCI needs to be banned. 
uh, immediately. Um, it puts a stranglehold on the format. I think I myself the last weekend had about 10 cards that were specifically dedicated for the KCI matchup. Um, and I'm not speaking from a point of saltiness either, because I myself have played KCI in to a, like a large success uh, in, in some events. Um, I myself have played bridge versions of the deck and various takes on it. But yeah, to answer your question, I think it's time to go. It, it's putting a stranglehold on the format. And with that being said, I don't think it's Ancient Stirrings that should go. A lot of people are talking about the Ancient Stirrings versus KCI band. Um, I'm not sure what your take on it is, but I feel strongly that it's KCI that is the oppressor, not Ancient Stirring itself. Uh, I'll save my take for last. I got to let my other guest go first, the innovator of the new build of this. Dom, we got to, well, I guess we don't have to ban something if you don't want to, but if you did, what would you ban? Oh, you, well, <laughs> I don't want you to. If you let me keep playing it, I will, I will gladly take you <laughs> up on that. But so, something has got to go, because if you, if you look at the reasons historically the decks have been banned, so, you know, sometimes justifiably, sometimes unjustifiably, regardless, it, it's you have a few different reasons so you can ban them for being too good in the abstract uh, maybe it's too bad for just tournament operations if uh, like eggs for, for instance was not too good but if every round was going 10 minutes past time because of the, the one eggs player who showed up for the tournament then then that's an issue uh maybe it's it's just too miserable to play against the play pants are unfun even if it's not too good or maybe it's just too bad for coverage and that's something which i think does need to be cared about here in 2019 now and KCI is all of those things at the same time it's completely egregious there's no reason it should still exist and it, I I know that it's easy to look at the results where it, there, there were three Phoenix decks in the top eight and it crushed the, the modern challenge at the same time or whatever and think that that's the problem instead and and KCI is fine but it's not and, and this will be a a sore on the format for as long as it's allowed to exist and I, I think you have to take the nuclear option I think you just have to ban KCI because if you kill stirrings if you kill I think Mox Opal would, would do it too but if you ban stirrings you ban trawler you try to if you take the approach they took with amulet and you leave it in the format in some form some like weird mutation will arise in a year and just take over again and then, and it will continue to be a problem i'm all for banning exactly car clan ironworks and nothing else as good as mox opal is and as good as ancient stirrings is if you ban stirrings you're also you're also icing like three or four different decks and i don't think you want to do that and then the same thing can be said with mox opal right now i i, I do agree that mox opal is a very 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 good card sam black and my deep analysis at magic fest oakland said that mox opal has been the most powerful card in modern for as long as it's been legal I'm not sure that i agree with that but it does enable some very good decks and i think this is the best mox opal deck that we have seen but that said like you know mox opal in various affinity shells or mox opal and lantern like yes it's good but i think it's at its most egregious here and if we just want to wipe you know this deck and Icar wellspring and scrap trawler off the planet i think you just ban kci itself and still let people play with their stirrings and their moxes and i don't know i'm not a game designer maybe that's a bad idea but i still want tron to be a thing that people can do i still want there to be mox opal decks look i don't have a problem with tron a lot of people do <laughs> i i don't i don't even think the deck is very good so like i don't have a problem with it but you know that's just my opinion I mean, pe people were calling you Tron guy long after you were off it, right? So you, you have you have no horse in this race now. No, no, no I mean, I, I, it's funny. Like back when I was streaming, and I think a lot of people forget this, seven years ago, <laughs> yes. I played Tron. And also when I was streaming seven years ago with Tron, I didn't win anything with it. <laughs> at no point did I win anything with it. I think my best finish was like 10 and five at a Grand Prix. My bread and butter finish. So like, it's not like we see Tron dominating week after week on any circuit. It never happens. It's just like the games where you get turn three car or turn four Ugin, it's annoying. But like, if your deck didn't do anything in the first three or four turns, your deck sucks. As I, as I think as that's I, the perfect point. Sorry, just to interrupt. But I think that's the perfect point because if you get rid of KCI, what's the next best agent stirring deck? It's, it's Tron and that's not even the most oppressive thing. No, it's not even close. Dom, go ahead. As I recall, you you were coasting through this online PTQ with Tron, and then uh, a, a then unknown Patrick Dickman uh, dunking on everyone along his way uh, took the slot, and then the rest was history from there, right? God, you do have a good memory. Now you're dredging up old ones, bad ones now. Yeah, he beat me in the top four. None of my tricks worked either. He was ready for all my Tron tricks. I, I know where the bodies are buried. Okay, that's what you want to learn about me. <laughs> Not many, I mean, I don't think many people have as good a memory as I do, but yes, he did defeat me in the top four. I can't remember. What's his magic online name? I can't remember. It was, Is it Ophelia? Uh, yeah, that sounds right. Okay, yeah, yeah. He beat me in the top four. He was playing twin, but like was boarding out of twin and boarding into Vendillion clicks and a bunch of various things. I thought he'd be one of the people who would like sideboard into Blood Moon, which is generally bad against Tron. He's like, I don't even have that. That's garbage. And I'm just like, all right, I'm outclassed here. 
fair enough. And he's gone. He's gone on to top eight. I think multiple PTs and demonstrate just how good he is. Uh, and you are demonstrating how good your memory is. So bravo, sir. Bravo. So we take. Uh, you guys take second place at Columbus. Now I'll ask you at the conclusion of that tournament. Obviously, you're probably a little disappointed that you lost in the finals. But at the conclusion of that tournament, was there a conversation had between the two of you or three of you with Omar that hey? Let's think about let's think about Worcester now because we are near the top of the standings. We're in second place. You know, we are off to a great start for the season. Tarek, were you thinking to yourself, hey, this is something maybe we should pursue? Or were you thinking that all along? All along for me, uh, living in Jersey, Worcester is actually a very um, reachable drive. So it was always on my schedule to go. Um, Don has a funny story about this. Uh, originally, I don't think anybody, any of the Canadians were planning on going. But I think the amazing run everybody had in Columbus kind of changed all that. And Dom and them kind of last minute decided, I think the Wednesday before the event to kind of pack up the car and, and head on down. No, no, Dom. Dom, is that true? Yeah. So we, <laughs> look, so we, we had this, this running joke among the teams that came down for Columbus that, well, if we top eight, I guess we're SCG grinders now. We're going to have to go to everything. We're part committed. Um, and then when both of our teams top aided, it actually started to seem like not a joke anymore. We might actually have to, to, to buy into all of this. And, and, and so there was a 5k going on the same weekend, half an hour drive away that also awarded SCG points. It's an IQ. So you would think we would just stay at home and, and go to that. And then like, I, I won the tournament and I still think this is a bad idea. Just trying not to be results oriented here. Like, it's, like it, it, there, there was no way any of this made sense, but you, you've been there before. Like you understand the mindset that you can get into with, with these trips. So uh, we, we packed out the car, we drove the eight hours to the middle of Massachusetts and uh, yeah, we just went from there. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, you, you two certainly made the most of it. That's for sure. If this was a bad idea, I don't know if there are any good ideas. <laughs> like, if you're getting first and second in an open, and I hate to say it, but yeah, you might. I know this is a giant pain in the ass for both of you. You might have to be SCG tour grinders. We might have to make player slides and have you on the players watch leaderboard a bunch of feature matches. I'd like to apologize in advance. I'm really sorry to the both of you that this is happening. Sure, I could live with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I just, I, I feel so bad. <laughs> I, I just, I really wish the points from the, from the Envy back in December still counted, because then I would just be on top of the world. But as it is, I'm still going to have to work for it a little bit, you know? Yeah, I mean, you'd have a bigger lead than you already do, I will say that. But we decided to do, I mean, it was a, it was a back and forth conversation quite a bit about a points reset and clearing it off and what we wanted to do to make it fair for everybody. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I suppose it is fair for everybody, and you guys are, you guys are leading things right now. So, let's talk about Let's talk about, boy, Worcester. Worcester, Worcester. So I'm sitting at home in Seattle, and I'm checking in on the tournament and everything. Ross is having a really good tournament, and then Nick Miller's tweeting about how, you know, you guys are near the top of the standings. Now you're one, two into the top eight, all that other stuff, able to draw in. All these things are going well. Um, Tark, again, I'm going to start with you. I see. Is it Phoenix <laughs> here as your, as your weapon of choice? It was a toss-up between Amulet and Is it Phoenix. And, ooh, you chose the better deck throw in some shade now is it phoenix is obviously obscenely popular it's very good ross Merriam did a lot of work on that deck he also made top eight again this past weekend in worcester we saw him win an open in baltimore all that stuff he's done a lot of work on this but now we're starting to see this deck evolve too with multiple different colors all that stuff so let me let me talk to you Tark, first about your thoughts on is it phoenix your take on is it phoenix where this deck is going why you chose it for the weekend sure yeah so like my profile said i was between amulet and is it phoenix uh, just to touch on Amulet briefly, I have a long history with it, a long love, loving history with it. Um, I've been playing it since the Amulet Bloom days. Um, I'm obviously good friends with Edgar, and he's known as the Amulet guy. So I've been around the deck a lot. I know the current innovations of it, and I know how to play it pretty well. Uh, that being said, um, and I got the privilege to play against Ross actually in the top four. He's put a lot of work into Is It Phoenix, and at its fundamental core, Phoenix is a broken deck in in modern paying one red mana to draw two cards but six power of flying and hasten to play is just an insane tempo play all the while you get to scry for future turns and interact with your opponent in the form of lightning bolt and i think those things combined kind of overshadowed the things that angler were doing and kind of led me towards playing phoenix on the weekend now you do know you know you have a bad burn matchup right <laughs> that's what they tell me they they say we have a bad burn matchup and i actually think i played it about four times in the event but f swinging for about 10 power on turn three usually solves a bad matchup so it has that ceiling that you can just go completely over the top of your opponents even if your matchup is quote unquote bad that's some of the appeal of the deck to be sure now let me ask you about these power mantras ascensions <laughs> because 
Uh, Eli Cassis, he won he won Magic Fest Oakland. I guess Grand Prix Oakland. That's just what who knows what the branding is with this anymore. He won a tournament in Oakland with Pyromancer mm-hmm. Ascension in his deck. Matt Sperling won the PTQ mm-hmm. that I also top aided. Mm-hmm. Uh, he won the PTQ with Pyromancer Ascension in his deck. Only two copies. It looks weird. Because we think Pyromancer Ascension, we think Storm, right? And instead, this is like a value Pyromancer Ascension in this deck, right? Correct, yeah. So Va- Pyromancer's Ascension is essentially that two flex slot that uh, Monastery Swift Spear uh, used to take up. And honestly, every card in that slot has just been mediocre since the beginning of time till now. And I'm sure in a couple of weeks, it'll be something different. I uh, admittedly just joined the hype train. I saw Ely's uh, deck list being posted. I read the Sperling article and I said, sure, why not? It's a potent mid-range threat. Ironically, the weekend before, there were Blood Moons in my uh, in my 75. Uh, two Blood Moons in the Pyromancer slot in the main deck, actually, in the team event that we came second with. And I replaced them with Pyromancer's Ascension, and sure enough, I play Amulet in the finals in Dom and, and instantly regret my decision <laughs> to to swap the Blood Moons out. So, But honestly, going forward, they, they're they honestly replaceable. They're, I wouldn't say they were stellar. In fact, they're always almost the first card uh, I sided out. They're poor in the mirror match. They're poor in the fast matchups. They're only really shine versus Death Shadow and Jund. And I'm not even sure they're blo- better than Blood Moon in in those specific matchups, uh, especially with the advent of, of Amulet on the rise and, and Tron still being a deck. Uh, you may just want to be playing Blood Moons in that slot. So I don't think anybody, including Ross Merriam, has, has totally figured out those last two slots yet, but it'd be really interesting to, to see what the common consensus is going forward. And this is the same deck. You also played this in Columbus as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not uh, the exact 75, but yep. very similar. Yeah, yeah, you've got the main deck Blood Moons in Columbus. So main deck Blood Moons, we got a hater in the house here, Dom. <laughs> he looks like he might be coming after you. First the trash talk in the top eight player profile, and now this. But I guess I guess you got the final say because you got the trophy, not, not Tarek. Um, I got to ask, man, this build of the deck, it, it takes a lot to take me by surprise. It's kind of my job to know what all the decks look like. <laughs> Otherwise, I shouldn't have my job. But when I saw your build of this deck, I literally said, what the hell? Because this is so different than what Edgar and Dilks and Daryl and everything that we've seen on the tour. And in general with this deck, it's your turn. It's your turn to talk, man. You got some explaining to do. Okay. Yeah. So I, my first game of the tournament, I play against uh, Abe Stein in Feature Match. And I, I lead uh, Teetering Peaks into Coalition Relic into Wayward Sawtooth. And he he said out loud, I have no idea what's going on. And that was basically the theme of the tournament as it as it progressed. Uh, so uh, like Tarek, I have a, a long love affair with Amulet. Uh, it's the, the one PT that I got to play. I qualified with Amulet Bloom, which d- despite what you're saying now, at the time, you knew it was busted. I knew it was busted. Everyone knew that deck was off the, off the scales insane. Um, and they wouldn't let me play it anymore. And uh, so for that PT, I tried a lot of different ways to stitch something back together and try and make it competitive and that's when i first realized that the teetering peaks interaction and i tried the through the beach versions uh some of them were, were very all in with like simian spirit guide and, and really pushing the combo aspect but then you do lose out some of the resiliency there uh so i couldn't get it to a point where i was happy with it and, and tabled it i came back to it about 18 months ago um was having some decent success locally with it but uh, i thought it was more of a fun project than anything else uh and then Coming into this tournament, I was all set on playing the the white amulet list that Edgar and, and that whole team top aided with in Columbus. And then as I was packing to leave, Edgar messages me and says, okay, we figured it out. You need to bring Golgari Rot Farms, Cranial Extractions, and a Gitrog monster. And I thought, <laughs> I, 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 fine, okay, whatever, Edgar. Like, you're, you're good. I trust you. Fine. I, I wasn't fully convinced, though. Um, so... I, I'm sitting in Rossum's basement, 2 a.m. before the tournament, and I, I'm not convinced. I, I hadn't, like, the, the black build wasn't appealing to me. The whitelist, I, I, I tried testing it a little bit. I wasn't getting the results that I wanted. And so I decided to do some some galaxy brain surgery on my amulet deck uh, in, in the midnight hours. And uh, I just came back to what I knew, uh, what I'd be having success with, and what I thought there was a, a solid theoretical grounding for. So I knew I was going against the grain. Insofar as there is a consensus with amulet, it's mostly people like Edgar and, and Daryl and so on doing most of the innovation there but I, I wanted to play something that I knew personally I was happy with and and so that's what I settled on so many questions first of all Edgar who I'm a really big fan of the Gitrog monster and cranial extraction really okay look the Gitrog monster is a horror so <laughs> oh, oh, oh now you're speaking my language <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just saying <laughs> yes it's also I, I'm told it's good against Death Shadow because they can't dismember it. It always trades with a a thing. I, uh, ask Edgar, okay? He can be the follow up. You you can uh, pick his brain about that. But uh, 
yeah, I, I didn't know what to think. And so I, I just, I, I went with what I knew. Yeah, that'll be, when I do have Edgar on, that'll be a very short podcast. Explain the Gitrock monster. Okay, get off the podcast. That's what that'll be. Just so everybody knows when that comes. Uh, all right, I'm going to start just firing away the questions because seriously, this deck is just. Okay. Sell me on, sell me and everyone listening on Wayward Sword Tooth, man. Uh, <laughs> sell me on the dinosaur. Okay, so. So the, the the stock inclusion in that slot for the the ramp purpose is secure tribe scout. Uh, Edgar's argument about that was that cutting scout polarizes your matchups because uh, when you need to go fast, scout is the best at that. Um, for me, it was the opposite. I, I felt that with with scout, you're always at the mercy of losing your entire explosive potential to a, a lightning bolt or gut shot god forbid which is just a main deck card in the best deck now um or fatal push or all of these cards which otherwise would not actually do anything against your deck suddenly can become game-winning spells in the right context um and if you look if you look at the math and how it works out with uh, amulet and then scout versus sawtooth the only way that scout is faster is if you have it on turn one and then play amulet on turn two in, in all other contexts if you lead turn one amulet turn two sawtooth will get you to six or get you to five just as quickly uh and Sawtooth, he's a big boy. He doesn't get bolted. He just hangs out on the field and mostly doesn't do anything in the early turns, but then it's surprisingly easy to get the city's blessing and to bless up. Uh, so uh, the the first match I played against Phoenix in the tournament, I mulled to four and I I won by curving Sawtooth into Through the Breach on Titan. Uh, so I got Connie Garden, Bounce Land, pick up Connie Garden, replay it. That gets me to 10. I can now attack. And now after my Titan dies to the, the Breach trigger end of turn, I now have this big threat on the board that my opponent has to deal with. Uh, and that's, I, I thought the, the Breach version was good before, but Sawtooth actually makes it a lot better because now you have this thing that sticks around and, and does a lot of work uh, after the game's over there. All right, all right, all right. That was a good, that was a good sell job. You can get yours today at starcitygames.com. <laughs> that, was, that was a good sell job on the Sword Tooth. Okay, um, the Coalition Relic. Go ahead. All right, so that one, you... If you have too many of these ramp effects, you have four Azusa and then uh, four Scout or some mix of scout, uh, scout, Sawtooth, Explore, whatever, you often get into these situations where you you have a surplus of ramp effects, but you don't have actual lands to use with them. Uh, and so Relic gets around that just by being a ramp sort in its own right. It gets you to six mana by itself, which is the, the reason that so many people moved off Explore was you need to get to six mana on turn four. And so something that only jumps you up by one doesn't do the job. Relic gets you to six by itself, or in this version, it can get you to five. If you don't have uh, a land drop, you still get to cast through the breach. It just also does things like uh, it lets you cast a Titan through a Blood Moon. It lets you, it, you're a mono green deck splashing Solaria West and Sun Home and Slayer Stronghold. So it fixes your mana at the times when you need it. Uh, and you have explosives and, and cyber cards and other things like that. And then also crucially, it's, it's another ramp card that you can find off your Ancient Stirrings because Stirrings in this deck is either fantastic, it finds you exactly the, the amulet or the bounce down that you need to go off, or it's terrible. It just finds you another land which you didn't need or which won't further your, your game plan. So being able to more consistently find either ramp in the form of Coalition Relic or threats in Emrakul that you can then through the breach makes Stirrings a lot better. And Stirrings is already busted, don't get me wrong. You know, you, you can have a bad Stirrings deck and it's still a great card, uh, but this adds new dimensions to that card that tie the deck uh, together more. That's all right. I don't want to leave you out here because you've played a lot of Amulet yourself. Um, are you buying into this Sword Tooth Coalition Relic stuff so far? I am, actually. I think the Coalition Relic is actually the most brilliant addition to the deck. I actually, I think it's borderline genius that, that he added it. Uh, everything he says actually makes a lot of sense. And, you know, when you first look at something like this, I think it's human nature to look at something different and, and immediately write it off as, as not correct. But the more I hear Dom talk about it, the more I hear the reasons behind why he did it. And then being on the first hand receiving end of his deck, I have to say, you know, if it works, it works. And, you know, the truth hurts regardless of not if you like it or not. So everything he's saying makes sense. And I'm a big believer in ancient stirrings into coalition relic to ramp you to, to six after four mana is you're playing like a, a fifth Azusa. And I think that's so huge. I think that's actually just really brilliant. And that's just the brilliance of Dom. All right, Dom. I need you to sell me on Two more cards. You ready? Hear me. Crumbling Vestige. So, so this is, to me, the most obvious one. This is, as soon as uh, I saw the spoiler in Oath of the Gatewatch, I thought, okay, this card seems tailor-made for Amulet. And I I think there's a good chance that I wasn't playing enough. And that there's some build that can play for and really lean hard on that. Because when this card is good, it, it really sets you up so nicely. So 
one of the problems you often have is let's say you leave turn one amulet and then turn two you have one of your your ram cards you want to be able to uh play that on turn two but then let's say you have bounce land azusa but you don't have any more bounce lands you want to be able to pick up the bounce lands you have one for future use uh if your azusa lives but you also don't want to pick it up and then delay your own development in case the Azusa dies for some reason. Uh, so with Vestige, you can play Amulet on one and then jump to three mana on turn two because you get the the mana trigger when it comes into play and it untaps on the Amulet because it comes into play tapped and that's usually that's a trade-off. Uh, you get to jump up to three and then you can keep around the bounce land or whatever it is that you're trying to work around. Uh, it's also very good against Damping Sphere, which it, this version already doesn't care about too much, but with Crumbling Vestige, it's it's just a joke. You you jump up to five or to six with Amulet through a Damping Sphere because you're you're making two mana through the back door, essentially. Um, and then also, if you don't have an Amulet, it lets you play a Titan and make mana on the same turn, whether it's to cast a removal spell or to uh, just whatever else you want to do. Uh, you can play a Titan and that's, you're not done yet. You, you have these these other lines. And also it means that if you draw the wrong land at the wrong time, so you you drew your Burrow Scout or, or you drew whatever, you now have more lines open to you where you can get this extra jump of mana in combat to uh, for Sun Home or, or for whatever else it is that you're trying to do. Especially if you have cheap interaction like Path to Exile or uh, in my case, Rending Volley, Dismember, stuff like that, you can turn your Primeval Titan into a Flame Tongue Carvey, basically. It can get you the extra mana to follow up. So you don't have to choose between interacting with your opponent and playing the Titan. You just get to do both at the same time. All right, good sell. Good sell. The fact that the fact that you looked at the set list and your immediately thought your immediate thought was this card's good in Amulet Titan is wild to me. It's my brain is just wired a certain way. Like uh, there was a, a Sam Black piece around the same time when he was talking about if if you're someone who is growing up playing combo decks or playing a particular style of deck, then the entire discussion around new cards looks very different. Uh, so when he was still playing Amulet at the time and people were getting excited about your know, collected company into scavenging use and stuff or, or Colligan's Command, and it's like, th these are not cards on the same plane as what I'm trying to do in the format. Um, and obviously things have changed a lot since then, but that, that same mentality still survives, I, I imagine for him and, and for a lot of other people. All right. Um, this last one's not going to need too much of a sell job because we got to see it a lot on camera, but, uh, old teeter and peaks, go ahead. It just kills them. I, I don't know what, <laughs> what, <laughs> what else do you want me to say? It's, it's, you, you just add two and then you add two again and then you double it and it's 20 and, it, and it's all good. So how did you find this one? Is there a story behind this? It's just, you, you have to do a lot of gather researches, you know, you, you search, every land in modern and there aren't that many so you can get through it pretty quick and you you recognize most of them uh but it, i don't know there was just like a eureka moment back three years ago when i was first experimenting with through the breach where you just realized that okay i, I want to add these cards to my deck but i need a way to make breaching titan uh a, a certified kill how can i do that well so i can get to sun home but then I need to boost its power and you can't really activate Stronghold because that, that ties up your mana too much. So is there another way we can do this? And then I remember Teetering Peaks and it actually works out perfectly. You get to, so the, the combo in case you didn't see it on camera was uh, you get Teetering Peaks and Sun Home. Peaks makes a Titan into an 8-6. Uh, they untap for Amulet. You attack, you get Vesuva and either Boris Garrison or Crumbling Vestige. Uh, Vesuva copies the Teetering Peaks, that makes it a 10-6, and then you get to, you have exactly enough mana to activate Sun Home, and, and that's 20, which is, is good enough most of the time. That's good enough more than most of the time. My god. Okay, well, now I'm just, you know, the Is It Phoenix stuff that you talked about, Tarek, that was, that was all well and good, but way less interesting than Crumbling Vestige and Teetering Peaks. Uh, I want, oh yeah, I'm learning. Yeah, I want to, I want to, no, there, there, <laughs> go ahead, Dom. There, there was, an, there was an, almost an endless sounds in my deck because when you, when you breach something in, oh, you get to attack and then tuck it under the endless sands and then bring it back next turn to dodge the sacrifice trigger. But that was a little too much. You know, I don't, didn't think that one was strictly necessary. So we left that, okay, left I'm that Googling the, uh, the amulet binder <laughs> for the weekend. I'm Googling endless sands right now. Cause I haven't, okay. It's, it's this card. <laughs> Yep. Okay. Yep. It's the old. Uh, it's the old land from Outer Devastation that everybody knows so much about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You are. Yeah. You earned this win. <laughs> That's for sure. You. <laughs> you. You earned this open win. Cause holy crap! Between this and Worcester, I don't want to play against you. Or between this and Columbus, I don't want to play against you in a tournament at all. <laughs> at all with the way that you think about magic it's unbelievable all right i want to let's see i got to make sure i got your sideboard up here to see if there's any spice running around in here uh okay so we've seen relic ballista queen world spine worms for the through the breaches 
Okay, so your sideboard's pretty normalized, all things considered. I wouldn't say there's anything too crazy going on here. Would you agree? Yeah, and a lot of that is not set in stone. I think the, the main deck is about where it needs to be, but the sideboard is, is more up in the air. I want to know about the world spy worm. Like, when, when is through the breaching and Emrakul just not enough? When, when did the world spine cut in and, and why? So sometimes you want to, if you don't have an amulet, you want to be able to pact for a target that's more likely to kill them. Uh, so against like Dredge, for instance, um, Emrakul is not actually that good against them. And Titan can be, but just being able to pact for a worm, sometimes it kills them that turn. Sometimes it puts them in check. They have to deal with three 5-5 five, five tramplers that they are just not that well equipped to deal with. Um, or against like Jun sometimes, uh, depending on their configuration, you can leave through the breach in. And so if you have one in hand, you want to make sure that any pack that you draw, you now essentially have five Wildspine Worms and, and five lethal threats. That means you don't have to keep in these Emrakuls, which are only good with uh, Through the Breach. <sighs> wow. Okay. All right. So let's 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 get to the next question here. And Because I've just thought of this topic off the top of my head. So we've talked about Ironworks and how good it is and the evolution that you put on the deck, Dom, and everything else, and how it is time to probably ban Carclan Ironworks, the card itself. And maybe we'll see that happen next Monday. Maybe we won't. But you also, and I think both of you, have very strong feelings about Amulet Titan and before Amulet Bloom, before they banned Summer Bloom, and how absurd that deck was. Um, this deck is obviously quite good. It sounds like you dominated this open, and many people had no idea what you were doing, and people are going to get an idea of what you're doing. But this might be the new build of the deck. Tark, I'm going to start with you. Like, is this deck just absurd? Is this the second coming of Amulet Bloom slash Amulet Titan? What are we, what are we thinking here? It might be. The more I hear Dominic talk about it, the more sense it actually makes. Um, I don't know if he told this already, but he came up with this deck list at 3 a.m. before the event. So it was it was an interesting little brew that he that he came up with. Um, but when when I hear him talk about it more and more, everything just seems to fit into place. So I could definitely see this being the optimal build going forward. I guess we're going to have to find out. Dom, uh, are you thinking... Did we break it for just one weekend? Is your deck still soft to Blood Moon like most Amulet Titan decks are? But, you know, not enough people are playing that card, so you don't care. Like, what, what are your thoughts coming out of this tournament and maybe moving into another modern tournament or just testing on, like, Magic Online or something? It, it definitely is soft to Blood Moon. Uh, the third reach stuff does help a fair bit there, but if you can back it up with, let's say, Dispels or Spell Pierces fall through the breach, or if you can back your Blood Moon up with other things, then it's still going to be lights out most of the time. And if the Phoenix decks move to, let's say, two or three Blood Moons in the board, or even if they start playing at main deck, which I don't think they can do given how popular the Mirror is and some other matchups, but if that becomes a thing, then obviously you have to put this on the back burner for the time being. Um, I, I I imagine KCI is a decent matchup. You, you're a little bit faster now, but it's still, it's still close. Uh, Aaron Barrett just clowned me at the Invitational and then again this weekend with Infect, which he does to everyone, but in, in particular with this deck, it's, it's still a terrible matchup. So it is highly exploitable and it, it does have bad matchups, but uh, despite what, you know, the, the no bad matchups thing that, uh, that Edgar and friends uh, like to joke about, but uh, I think it's good. I don't know if it's a straight improvement over regular Amulet, but uh, it's what I would take into battle again if I wanted to play the deck. And I think it will remain good, like a solid like tier 1.5 deck, if, if we want to use that terminology. We can use that terminology for now. It might be it might be better than tier 1.5. We'll see within like the next two weeks, I'm sure. But this is the kind of deck list where it's just I, like I, you, you initially look at it and it's just like, all right, random person won this tournament, I guess. And I don't think that anymore after talking to you. I, I would say like Shadow is also a bad matchup and some of the matchups are close like i i beat burn twice in just incredibly strange circumstances i think some of which were called on camera but you need luck to win a magic tournament i had my fair share of luck over the weekend um and it's just the way it goes but i, I think the deck is is very solid and i'm you know i'm definitely proud of of it and and the accomplishment all right future scg tour grinders i'm calling you that now uh dom, dom i'm gonna start with you before i come back to you uh Tariq. what is the plan now uh, for you, obviously, we've got SCG Indie release weekend for Ravnica Allegiance taking place. Uh, we've got an event after that, which is escaping me its location, um, but I'll bring it up on the schedule here. Um, we do Indie into Dallas the week after, which is pretty far from both of you, into a decent break, uh, and then we head over to Syracuse. So you're at the top of things right now. Uh, you know how to qualify for the SCG PC, if that's the goal. Uh, but I'm curious, like, what the goals are. Are, are we going to see more of you guys now because of this? And uh, Dama, I'll let you kind of lay out what maybe your goals are now after this hot start. 
so I, I guess the ultimate goal is win the players championship now i i aim big uh, i don't know um there's obviously a long road to get there uh, this is a great start the best i could hope for but yeah you'll be seeing me at um, basically all the stops i can attend i might skip dallas because it clashes with the, the gp here in toronto but uh still unclear on that which was not something i expected to have to say you know two weeks ago but uh we're in the spot now where i yeah i'm a SCG tour grinder i suppose um it's it is tough because you're in the past i've I played competitive magic for a long time but i was never chasing silver or bronze or anything so i would play a tournament and then hopefully do well at the tournament but either way it was mostly self-contained whereas now all of this stuff is kind of feeding into each other and there's this larger purpose and larger end game in sight now um so i'm having to evaluate for the first time like what level of commitment it takes and what sacrifices i want to make and given that i've just moved here a few months ago like my philosophy when i moved was just say yes to everything basically just embrace every opportunity you can and try and meet as many people as you can and it's been working out great so far but it's it's hard to say yes to everything when so much of your time is spoken for with magic um and i've seen a lot of people i know who are very successful in magic but to get there that's that's all they do they they work their nine to five they come home they play modo or maybe arena now for six hours and then they go to bed and then at the weekends they're traveling to a tournament and that's fun in and of itself but everything else then has to compete for the table scraps that that leaves behind um and so i'm still trying to figure all of that out like how how much i really want to double down on this uh but it feels like if if there's any chance to do that now would be the time so i imagine that's what i'll be doing Tarek, you're obviously a uh, pretty busy guy as we discussed at the beginning of the podcast and a bit before pre-recording you're like traveling around for some med school type things that I'm sure you can describe here in just a moment. But, you know, I ask you the same question. Uh, what are the goals? Where are we going to see you? All that jazz. Yeah, I'm currently in interview season right now. So my schedule is very uh, week to week and uh, filled to the brim. But the current schedule, and I, I don't know if Dom mentioned it, but Baltimore, I think, is February 2nd and 3rd. I think it's a team open. Uh, we'll be there for that for sure. So I'm looking forward to running it back there. Um, Indianapolis and Dallas, like you mentioned, is a bit of a drive for us. So we'll try and make it out, but no promises there. Um, but for the rest of the season, um, I'm looking at the schedule and it seems pretty manageable. So hoping to go out and, and make kind of an impact and just kind of continue the run. But as you know, and, and how everybody listening knows, Magic's the type of game where, you know, you're playing well one day and don't get the results. And next day you're playing poorly and everything goes right for you. So I think the big thing is just continue to do the little things right and, and hope everything works out. I'm not going to look too far into the future. I don't think I have Dom's bravado to call out player champion already. So I'll kind of just keep focusing on doing the little things right. I feel like I'm playing solid magic right now. Um, I was very happy with my play over the last two weeks. And I really just hope to kind of continue that into the future, uh, kind of control and, and do everything I can control as, as well as possible and kind of just let the chips fall with the, where they may. Well, so far for the both of you, you guys have done a nice, maybe perfect job of controlling your destiny so far. First and second now on the SCG Tour leaderboard early on here in 2019. Really, really looking forward to honestly covering some of your matches now. I've had the first two weeks off for coverage. Uh, I jump into the booth for Indianapolis in two weeks. And then I'm not there for Baltimore, and then I'm back in the booth for Dallas. And, you know, you said I'll probably see you guys in Baltimore running back the team thing. Maybe we'll see in Indy, maybe we'll see in Dallas, maybe sick here. Syracuse, pardon me, who knows. But um, at the very least, the two of you put on one hell of a show the past two weeks. So congratulations uh, to that, uh, and congratulations to you for that, pardon me. Uh, it's been fun. It's This is one of my favorite things about the SG Tour, is we get to see people kind of make a name for themselves. Uh, a handful of years ago, nobody knew who Kevin Jones was or Andrew Jessup or a bunch of other people. And I take a lot of pleasure in being able to see players be able to make a name for themselves on a circuit like this one where they probably wouldn't be able to do so otherwise on the GP circuit since it's so crowded. And so this has been fun. Um, Dom, your take and your knowledge of magic is really impressing me right now. Uh, most people I meet don't have the memory that you do about the game, um, especially in line with mine, because I remember so much because I've been playing so long and I have an insane memory uh, myself and along with some of the people I talk to, mostly Jerry. So uh, kudos to you. And uh, Tarek, I, I obviously am impressed with you as well, because uh, I think you've really established like the ability to play is a Phoenix very, very, very well. And I want to get into that very quickly before we put a close on this thing, because I know a lot of people are wondering why in the hell you are drawing 
against Grixis Death Shadow because when I saw Nick post that on social media, I messaged him directly and was just like, that that cannot be true. Yeah, yeah. That can't be true. Yeah, so a lot of people have told me that that it can't be true. And actually, it wasn't at first my idea. Um, I keep spreadsheets and data of all the matches I play on Magic Online. I think I've played close to about oh, 120 matches versus Grixis Death Shadow and uh, Black Green decks um, on Magic Online. And I started noticing a trend that my win percentage was about you know 10% higher in the Black Green matchups and about 12% higher in the Death Shadow matchups on the draw. and it's interesting because stuff like this is not always intuitive to humans in general, like why a concept like this would be advantageous. But just running with it, there there are a number of reasons why I could see this being true once I kind of just accepted it to be fact. Um, the Is It Phoenix decks in general play a very like setup, setup, power turn type meant, like game plan where you spend the first couple of turns setting up a big turn three where you get a bunch of phoenixes back, or you flip a, a thing in the ice, and then set up again for your next power spike turn. So when you play against matchups that have Thoughtseize or counter magic, such as Death Shadow, that really simplify the game as fast as possible, being ahead on cards or having that one extra card really does make all the difference because it doesn't matter if you get to go first if you don't have the resources to enable the phoenix, for example. You still need three spells during that turn. It's just optimally cap to, uh, casting your cantrips um, plays a huge role on it, but the extra card I found um, is essential in making the the game plan work versus uh, decks that like to simplify the board state very quickly. So we've got Dom over here doing his brewing like crazy with all these weird decks and winning. We got you drawing first in Magic, in Modern, excuse me, not just in Magic, in Modern, the play first format, and you're both stringing together a bunch of wins. Obviously, the two of you are doing something right. And to everyone who is attending SCG Baltimore, beware. Is Omar the third? Uh, undecided yet. Um, we're going to have to see what the travel plans are like for the Canadians. It's either going to be Omar Belden or Keith Capstakes. So one of the two will definitely be there for sure. All right. Well, we know you guys will be there, and we are very much looking forward to it. Now, before we do end this, I'm going to let you do some shameless plugs here. So, Dom, I will start with you again for all your Twitter and social media and everything else and potentially writing an article for StarCityGames.com. We'll talk about that after the show. Um, go ahead, shout it out so people can figure out where to find you. All right, uh, so Magic Stuff is at Dom and Javier. Uh, everything else at Dom HRV. Uh, just add me on Facebook, always happy to talk about either Amulet or just Magic in general, anything else with people. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out if, if you have a question or anything like that. And uh, yeah, that'll do it. Uh, Tarek, for you, if you'd like to share your information, by all means. Yeah, for sure. So uh, you can add me on Facebook. My name is Tarek Patel. Um, I also recently just made a Twitter account because I was told that I probably should have one. So I guess this will be my first official uh, plug of a newly minted Twitter. So you can follow me at Tarek Patel 10. Uh, I guess that's the Twitter. Uh, also, in a couple days, um, Wednesday to be exact, I'll be streaming Legacy with Kevin Jones at the Bearded Dragon. Um, we have a broken deck in Legacy. I won't reveal it here. You'll have to come find us there, but <laughs> we will be playing it on stream, and I promise you it's a good one, so you're going to want to see it. Ooh, a nice little tease. Now that's how you do a podcast right there, man. That's how it's done. Now the people have to tune into the stream and find out what's going on, and with, with Tarek, with, with the daddy, Kevin Jones, it's probably going to be a pretty good stream. So congratulations to both of you. Thanks for hanging out here on the podcast. Uh, I look forward to your performances throughout the rest of 2019 and I'm sure I'll run into you at one of these events and I'm wayward sword tooth okay that's where we are in modern now wayward sword tooth uh congrats once again to you Dom and Tarek thank you for having us thank you it's been a pleasure well everybody I hope you enjoyed what was a very fun episode to record with Dom Harvey and Tarek Patel two players who are really beginning to make a name for themselves on the SCG tour and magic in general. And if you took anything away from that, like I did, boy, this Dom Harvey fellow, he is not afraid to go outside of the box with his build of Ironworks and now this crazy obscure build of Amulet Titan. I'm really looking forward to seeing them team up once again at SCG Baltimore in a handful of weeks and just seeing where 2019 will take them. When you get off to a great start like this, 
man, you can really go places and make a name for yourself like we've seen so many do, like Kevin Jones, Andrew Jessup, and so many more on the SCG Tour. So it should be a lot of fun throughout Q1 and Q2 of 2019 on the SCG Tour. As I mentioned at the top and during the show, I'll be in Indianapolis next weekend as the SCG Tour is on hiatus this weekend for the Ravnica Allegiance pre-release but for the release weekend i'll be in indy with patrick sullivan brian gottlieb jerry thompson nick miller and the rest of the scg tour crew so hopefully you're able to uh hang out and watch what should be one hell of a weekend there twitch.tv slash scg tour is a place to go next weekend of course boy what else is there there's a lot in my life as most of you guys do know you can of course find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Cedric A. Phillips. Also on Twitch, too, since I've begun streaming again. Also, twitch.tv slash Cedric A. Phillips. Got to be on brand. You know that. Uh, I mentioned Coalesce at the beginning. I'll mention it at the end here as well. Coalesceapparel.shop is the brand new shop that I have for Magic Apparel and Design. Uh, three guilds basically done, seven more to go, and there's going to be a lot of fun things in there besides guild shirts. Trust me, as we make our way through 2019, have a very, very highly motivated team that are way more creative than I am, that I am so, I'm having so much fun working with. So I hope you guys check that out, bookmark that, uh, and hopefully you find something that you like while you're over there. That'll be great. Of course, my friends over at Star City and Ultimate Guard, as I mentioned on the top, thanks to them for sponsoring the podcast, and thank you guys for listening to it, which of course you can find this over on stitcher spotify itunes the podcast app soundcloud and over at patreon.com slash the cedric phillips podcast if you do want to become a patron they've got ultimate guard sleeves we've got cedric phillips goblin tokens from star city games uh giveaways that'll be resuming next week and a whole bunch more so uh you can check out all of the reward tiers again over at patreon.com slash the cedric phillips podcast and I think this is the last one because I've already done enough shilling for the day. If you like what you listen to, of course, you can leave a review on iTunes. Reviews do help, and I do check them out. So five stars would be dope. Um, But if you hated what you listened to, I guess you can leave a nasty rating of one star and tell me I'm the worst. But uh, reviews are good no matter what. So if you have the time, uh, please leave one, and it'll be much appreciated. Later this week, uh, looks like it's going to be some NBA talk with me, Joe, and some of the guys in my uh, group chat on Facebook. And then next week, going to be coming back with some more Magic Conversation to lead into uh, Ravnica Allegiance release weekend, uh, some more wrestling because we got to preview the Royal Rumble, uh, and then maybe a little surprise that I don't want to give away just yet. Either way, thanks for listening, and congrats to Dom Harvey and Tark Patel on kicking ass so far here in 2019. Baby, I believe- Show me what you